Tyler, thank you. And um, Zach, man, you can play. Where'd you go? Man, you play that thing, man. I almost wanted to just, you know, you know, you go to this concert, you hold the light, you know, for. <laughs> let's keep it going. That's good stuff. Y'all hear that every day? You come every Sunday. You come here. You hear that? Kind of, is that right? And y'all appreciate it fully, don't you? You let them know that they're doing a great job, right? I know you don't know who I am, so I can say just about anything I want to say, right? <laughs> um, my name is Jeff. I, I have pastored in this uh, state for over 30 years, 35 years. Um, I've been in the ministry over 40. Um, one of the places that I served was a short distance from here, um, Four Oaks. Uh, First Baptist. I, um, I that was my first church, and if uh, if y'all know anybody in the Four Oaks area, um, <coughs> you might want to well tell them that you understand now. <laughs> uh, no, we had a great relationship there. Still have a lot of good friends there uh, that uh, we go see quite a bit. So I enjoy that very much. But I'm glad to be here this morning. I, um, I retired from the pastorate in January of this year. I know I'm not, I don't look retirement age, and, I, and I'm not. Um, I'm only 61. Um, but I just felt like it was time for me to um, uh, find something else, but not forget the church. And so I've been doing uh, a lot of work. Uh, that I couldn't do when I was the pastor full-time of a church. So I'm enjoying that, and I'm having a, have a good time. been in a lot of churches here in the Raleigh area. Roger Nix and I go back a long way. He's older than I am. Um, I'm much better looking than he is, but he is a great guy, and I know you're glad to have uh, him as your uh, director of missions here. Um, but I am I'm thrilled to be in the Raleigh area now, living with my daughter, Audrey, and her husband, Daniel, and our grandson, Anderson. And uh, we've recently purchased a house together. Now, isn't that something? Never thought that would happen. Uh, I tell everybody, ask me how I'm doing. I say, I'm doing fine as long as they don't kick me out, and I don't think they're going to just yet. Um, so we are having a good time together, and uh, again, I'm glad to be here. I want to begin uh, our time here with uh, a reading of the passage of Scripture, Psalm 111. I like that you have it printed here. It's in uh, a version that I'm not using, but I'm going to read it anyway from that so that uh, you'll feel comfortable and I'll be fine. Um, but here are the words of the Lord in Psalm 111. Praise the Lord, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is His work and His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious passionate. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will remember His covenant forever. He has made known to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of His hands are truth and justice, and all His precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness, he has sent redemption to His people. He has ordained His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. Pray with me. God, thank You for Your praise. May it spread throughout this place this day. We wait on you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
I know you don't know who I am, and I don't come here today to um, change your minds on anything. And I don't come here, hopefully, with all of my ideas, but rather with the Scriptures. But I've got to I've gotta say... I don't know if you've noticed, but my opinion, and this is my opinion, we are living in an age where humans are shaping the earth. Now, I know at face value that sounds pretty normal. It sounds what we might even expect to be going on. But within that activity, the changing of the earth, the shaping of the earth by human beings, I am reminded, especially as I read this particular passage, that there is a challenge to those of us who are people of faith to be shaped by God instead. Now that's just a fancy way, I suppose, of saying we live in a human-centered world. And we need to live in a God-shaped world. Now, I want to spend the next few moments that we have together. Um, you said, what, they're taking blood at 1230? Man, that is something else. You're going to hear a sermon and then you're going to give up blood. Yeah. Well, that gives me a lot of time. Um, anyway. I want us to look at what all of this stuff from from the standpoint of the psalmist means for us in the world in which we live. Uh, Because this is an explosion of praise, isn't it? It's an explosion of praise for all of the wonderful things that God is doing. Uh, It is radically... God-centered from the very beginning of this where, by the way, that's, that, that's the old word, praise the Lord, the old hallelujah, okay? Uh, but it's translated here, praise the Lord, same thing. But, but that's the old hallelujah. You would read that in the King James. Um, but hallelujah, praise the Lord. That's the way it starts. And then it ends, his praise endures forever. I mean, this is an explosion of praise centered completely on God. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, says the psalmist. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by those who delight in them. That is the works of the Lord. Full of honor and majesty in his work and his righteousness endures forever. This is quite a shock, isn't it? Because in this world, we we live in a place that is much more human-centered. And you know what that means. We expect the world to work for us. We expect the farmers to feed us, the judges to offer us justice. We expect the teachers to give us wisdom. But that's not the word of this psalm. God provides food, the psalmist says. God provides the food. The works of His hands are faithful. They are just. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's it's really turning our world on its head. We're not always comfortable with that, are we? In the human world the psalm challenges us to become more centered upon God to move from the human to God shifting now and shifting for all time Um, years ago Joyce Kilmer wrote a poem, and uh, part of that poem, uh, he wrote this, Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. All right? Well, that's a safe bet, but I assume that he was unaware 
that we humans can make a rock. Did you know that? We've stepped into the creation business. We are making a new stone. It's got a name. I, I could try to pronounce it, but it will just, I'll just butcher it. I'm from the South. Plastiglomerate. It's a long word. You need to remember that, though, if you ever play Scrabble again. Do we play Scrabble anymore with the board? Not often. But anyway, this particular rock is found on the beaches of Hawaii. It's composed of volcanic solids that have been created, uh, accidentally, by the way, by campfires on the beach. Plastic from soda bottles, fishing lines that have melted and become a sticky goo. They're cemented together into a mixture of volcanic rocks, sand, and shells stuck together. They are materials that are going to remain together for a long, long time. It's being called a techno-fossil. It's another sign of how the humans shape and are shaping the very nature of the planet that we live on. We are living in an age of humans influencing and impacting the earth. And the time has come, and, and really this is not the first time. If you look at Scripture, and I'm going to show you that as we go through this, if you look at Scripture, this has been going on a long time. The prophets argued with the people and, and complained to the people over and over again. You know, you're not really listening to God. Uh, you're not really hearing what God wants you to hear. You're not really doing what God wants you to do. They got really into that uh, thing uh, about sacrifice, you know. They really got into that. They liked that. And, and, and then the prophets turned around and told them, you think you're doing God's, you're worshiping God, but God really thinks your sacrifices stink. I mean, you know. <laughs> so, you know, something's going on here. What's going on is we are missing the point and the psalmist wants us to get back to that, and I, I want us to touch on that. So let's do that. Where do we begin? Well, if you look at the psalm, where do you begin? You begin with praise, right? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The writer of Psalms says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright and in the congregation. Hallelujah. One single word begins the entire psalm. The shout of praise coming from the psalmist's whole heart. What does that mean? That means all of his being, all that he is. The psalmist is putting his whole person into this. We like to split things up from a human standpoint. You know, there's your personality, there's your emotions, um, there's your intellect, uh, but there's no split when it comes to uh, praising God. There's no fracture, if you will, in who we are. True worship is grounded in our entire being. The Bible would say body, soul, and mind. You know, it's everything. It, it's all-encompassing. In, in, a, in a setting like this, we can be, we can be together, uh, old and young. We can be together... Uh, and in harmony, um, you know, those who are, are highly educated and, and those who aren't doesn't make any difference in God's, in God's view of things. All of us are equal in the eyes of God. So all that matters is that we worship God with our whole heart. And that's the challenge that is given to us. You remember the story of Abraham? It's a long story, but there's a part of that story that I want you to hear uh, this morning because it deals with this idea and the importance of praise and praise with one's whole body. Now, if, if you were going to pick out a character from the Scriptures and say this character embodies or personifies faith, Abraham would be at the top of your list, right? Uh, even the Bible puts Abraham at the top of the list when it comes to being a person of faith and great faith. If you go back and look at the travels of Abraham as he, as he came down from uh, his home uh, at God's calling, came down into, uh, into Israel and into the promised land or towards the promised land. If you remember that journey, 
there were a number of times when, as a wanderer, he comes into an area, and, 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 and the culture was this. If you, and, and, and Abraham, we're told in Scripture, had a great family, I mean a huge family, apparently, so large that he created quite a stir when he came into the neighborhood, you know. People said, well, what does this guy want, you know? What is he going to do? How long is he going to stay? You know, uh, is he a, does he come with violence in his head or, or, or a warring kind of thing? So basically, culturally, what would happen, Abraham would come into the area, and the first thing Abraham would do would be to, to search out the king or the leader, the ruler of that particular area, and go to him to make sure that they understood that there would be no problem. That we're just here, we're just going to stay here for a few days or a few weeks, a month, whatever, and then we'll be gone. You know, kind of like those relatives that come in at Christmas and don't leave until, what, Easter, you know. But anyway, that's, that's what Abraham would do. Uh, but it's to an even more important part, if you go back and look at the story of Abraham, when things were really good for Abraham, you know what he did first? He built an altar. He built an altar and they praised God. Then he went out and found the ruler. Now when things didn't go well, guess what? He forgot to build the altar. Maybe it was out of fear, lack of faith. I don't know, but it led to, to problems with, with the king of the, of the land in which he was abiding and living at that time. <clears throat> but the important part here is we are challenged to be exactly like that in our interaction with our community whenever we can we're reminded by psalm 111 to give thanks to god in the company of the upright in the congregation now i've served baptist churches for 40 years and uh, in some form or fashion and i've heard in every one of those churches i've heard this line the church is not a building heard that y'all heard that you said it Okay, I'm good. We're on the same page. All right. I figured y'all were Baptists, so that would be a, something that would be right off the, you know. Okay. All right, so, so here we are. We, we know the church is not a building. That it's people. And, and so my thought process here and my, my words here are not an accusation. I'm simply going to ask this question. When are we going to do that? Because I live with millennials I work with millennials more so than I ever have in all my life it's one of the good things about being retired uh, from the pastoral ministry I was insulated when I went to the church I was surrounded by people who knew God the way I knew God who worshiped the way I worshiped okay but now I'm out in, in, in real life, you know, and I'm running into people who are millennial. You know what? They don't go to church. Now, they're not bad people. In fact, they're very, they're very faith conscious. But they don't go. They call it a box church. They go to a box church. But the Bible is clear, isn't it? When, when we talk about the church, we're not talking about a building. We're talking about a gathering of faithful people. When is the church going to get that message? When are we going to hear that and actually do it and understand that at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, while you and I, obviously, we got the message and the memo, we're here. But the vast majority of the people are out there. We need to find a way to, to meet in the congregation, to gather together in community, and a community of support, a community of, of accountability. And we learn from each other. We're inspired by each other. We're strengthened by each other. I was thinking the other day, uh, one of my very, very, very close friends, a year ago, about this time, lost his wife. And um, it just so happens that I was able to... Um, to be there, to minister with them, uh, even though we were friends. He was also a part of a church that I had served. And <clears throat> we had an opportunity um, to be a help to each other uh, in that moment. Haven't you in those moments ever wondered, how do people 
who are not a part of a church get through times like that? You know, I have. I've wondered about that. So why not, why not try to find a way to get out beyond these walls in a, in a way that, that is supportive of each other, that brings a community together, that lets the people out there know we don't think they're bad people just because they didn't come at 11 o'clock. Praise to the community, inspiring, seeing God's work, not just our work. You know, so many times in the church when I, when I did something, we did something as a church, didn't work. Y'all, everything y'all do works, right? Huh? When you when you do a ministry, it all works. Every oh, okay. Well, I can tell you, not every church is that way. I I pastored many churches where we would do this great thing and think, oh, we're going to reach out and people are just going to flock. You know, they didn't come, and and we wonder, well, what happened? You know, what happened? Well, what happened was we began to see it as our work and not God's work. It became human-centered and not God-centered. We see God's work more clearly. We're able to praise God more joyfully. When we worship together, we are shaped by God. We become a more thankful people. And I don't know about you, but I'd far much rather spend my time around thankful people than unthankful people. People who are always complaining. Forget it. I don't want to hear it. Let's be thankful. Share praise together. Okay, so that's one. After the beginning of praise, where do we go? Well, the psalmist says we move into discovery. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. We're, we're changing our, our, our worldview now from a human point to a, to a God view of the world. And we see that God gained renown by his wonderful deeds. What does the psalmist talk about? Talks about things that really touched the lives of the people they would understand. He talked about liberating the people of Israel from the captivity in Egypt. We learn that God is gracious and merciful in verse 4. Just as he was to the Israelites after they sinned when they worshipped the golden calf. Uh, we're reminded that God provides food for those who fear him in verse 5. Just as God fed the people of Israel with daily manna in the wilderness, and we see that God has shown his people the power of his works by bringing them safely into the promised land. You know, one of the big issues I have sometimes with church folk is we expect all the works of God to be so grand and wonderful and beautiful and, and everything, and, and it's supposed to be the absolute best. I wonder how the modern believer or the modern church would fare if we showed up for one of our potlucks and we just had a bowl of manna. I wonder what would happen. That stuff wasn't real good. And in fact, in fact, the Israelites didn't like it much at all, but it was all they had and it kept them alive. Okay? But there was a time when they started complaining, hey, we don't like this stuff. You know? And buddy, if you tried to hoard it, guess what? Do y'all have, when you have potluck, do people take stuff home? Yeah, I remember one of the churches I had, we'd have this big, I mean, we only had about 125 people, you know? But we'd have this big, enough for a thousand, you know? <laughs> and, and everybody would eat three or four times, you know? And then they'd all take a plate home. Okay. Well, you couldn't do that with manna because yeah. it, 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 uh, it got even worse, okay, even worse once they kept it. Um, but that's what he brings up here. He talks about, well, we provided food. We gave you manna in the wilderness. Oh, well, thank you. God has shown his people the power of his works. He brought them safely into the promised land. So when we discover what God has done, we, we then be, we come to realize just how good God is. So good, His righteousness endures forever. We begin to understand that God will liberate us from anything that holds us captive, as well as, as forgive us and feed us 
and lead us into the future that God desires for us. We discover that God is always working for good in our lives. Now, hear that the way it's supposed to be heard. God is always working for good. Well, we may have to be convinced sometimes. Okay? Because it may not feel good. But God is always working for good, always in our lives. We are shaped by God into more understanding people. Oh my goodness, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> yeah, we're, we, we're loving people, but we don't understand a thing. You know, we don't understand how to use it, don't understand how to, how to love like we should. All right, so we've got understanding we've got we've got discovery um, now look where the psalmist goes we've praised we've begun our worship we focused on God we're seeing all that God is doing now what well according to the psalmist we are now able to trust the works of God's hands are faithful and just says the psalmist all of his precepts how many all all of his precepts are trustworthy we can trust what God has done because God is faithful to us there are a lot of things in this life we trust right and, and a lot of them are good um, but there's nothing in this world that we should ultimately trust no one in this world that we should ultimately trust. The only thing that we have that, 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 that should encompass all of our trust and all of our trust always is God. We can trust what God has done and said because God is faithful, God is fair, God is faithful and fair to the people in the past and He will be in the future. He doesn't make promises He cannot keep, but instead... Verse 9, he has commanded his covenant forever. So we have this promise-based relationship with God. It's not something that comes and goes. He's made it, he's kept it, and he continues to renew it. He renewed it through his Son. And now, through faith in Christ, it is renewed daily. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the psalmist says in verse 10. Our wisdom begins when we look up to God with awe, with respect, a deep understanding of God and humans expressed in how God has interacted with us through Christ. I, um, I know these are the words of the psalmist, and I know they were written, they were probably even sung, uh, years before Christ ever came on the scene. I realize that. But when I look at, at, at these words, I read these words, and then I look at the life of Christ, you know what I see? I see an individual who more than anyone else trusted God, praised God, understood God, and understood what that was supposed to look like. Oh, there are so many stories I want to share with you, but I, there, there's one, I, I just love the story. I've always loved it, ever since I was, you know, a little guy in, in Sunday school. The story of the woman at the well. Do you remember that story? Oh, we, we blow by some of these stories like, oh, yeah, okay, that's a good story. That's a wonderful story. Here, here is this woman, this Samaritan woman, a woman of a different race, there was, there was enmity, if you will, or uh, distrust. There was a lack of relationship. There was genuine hatred between Jews and Samaritans. Jesus was a Jew. I have it on good authority. The woman was a Samaritan. Sitting at a well, or at a well, walking up to the well as Jesus was sitting at the well. You remember the story. And Jesus asks this woman, give me something to drink. Do you know how unlawful that was? 
do you realize how out of the box that was? For Jesus to even speak to a woman, let alone a woman of the dreaded race, in this case a Samaritan. And she caught it right away. She said, why are you talking to me? Why are you speaking to me? And of course, the conversation goes far beyond just water, doesn't it? It goes far beyond that. It goes into a challenge to this woman to change her life to become someone different, to become a person of faith. And we see that, not only for her, but for the others that she brings to Jesus. And the disciples, they're blown away. You know, every time Jesus did something that that displayed the character of God, the disciples didn't know what to do. They They just sat back and said, can you believe this guy? What about the, another story I love so much in the end of John, the story uh, of, of the woman caught in the act of adultery? Not John, Mark. The, the, anyway, the beautiful story of, of Jesus saying to this woman, you know, who condemns you? That's not supposed to happen, folks. It's not supposed to happen. In that culture, that was not, that was not supposed to happen. Jesus not only put himself over against... Um, just the general thought of the people around him, but he, he broke the law. This is what happens when you hear the words of the psalmist and you praise and you discover and you understand and you trust God. When we're willing to trust God, guess what happens? God shapes our lives. God shapes our lives. We don't tell God what God's supposed to do, or we don't tell God what we're supposed to do. We hear from God what to do. God shapes us. Praise, discovery, trust, all a part of that. Moving from a human-centered approach to a God-centered attitude shapes us into more understanding, thankful, and faithful people. I don't think anybody can live in this world and not feel that tension. Um, We wake up every day and somebody else tells us what God says. You've come today and I've told you what God says. Who do we believe? What do we think? What do we value? Well, it all depends on how you're looking at it. If you're looking at this passage with the eyes of a human, you're you're not even in the ballpark. But if you're looking at it from a centering of God, it all makes sense. There's no one else we can trust. No one else, not in this life or the life to come, except God. No one else can do for us what God can do for us. Thanks be to God, who gives us so very, very much. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you, God, that in a world that so often just refuses to see with your eyes. You stand with us and continue to invite the faithful to be shaped by your hands. Sometimes, God, it's hard for us to admit that we've moved in a different direction or moved in a wrong direction. And then we hear the words of the psalmist and we understand sometimes we don't begin with praise. We don't trust. And we certainly don't look for your work in this world. We value too much our own handiwork. We build our rocks. Help us, God. 
Help us to center our lives upon you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your love. And thank you for Jesus who shows us how to live. In his name we pray.